All right, well, welcome everyone to our final scheduled meeting of the uh, sustainability uh, subcommittee. Uh, it's been a fun, fun ride. Um, call the meeting to order at 12.01. Um, on the call, we have um, Nelly and Kyle from the Vermont CCB, uh, from the Sustainability Subcommittee. We have myself, Jacob, Paul Turner, and Stephanie Smith. And from NACB, we have Tom Nolasco. Um, joining right now. And, and Gina uh, Cranwinkle as well. Um, do we have any members of the public? We have two members of the public here. And two members of the public, fantastic. Um, so with that, we'll get started with um, approving the meeting minutes um, from October 21st and October 25th. Um, I uh, sent those out with the revisions that Stephanie had sent and got written approval from Billy. Um, and Stephanie, I assume but i guess verbal confirmation that with those um uh changes you approve them as well yeah and i approve them as well so they pass unanimously and the meeting minutes from october 21st and the 25th um have been approved so for today's meeting uh, it's kind of a, a wrap up um of some just kind of outstanding business and helping um kyle with some presentation material he's got for the rest of the board um so far we've gotten um approval from the commission or the cannabis control board for kind of the energy water and waste recommendations um, that we've discussed um i guess before we get into that um, I guess the next order of business moving forward is I'm going to be, I'm in the process of kind of typing up everything that we've discussed um, as far as energy, water, waste, um, land management, pesticide use, um, air quality um, to provide to the CCB. And the plan is to kind of have a draft available for you, Stephanie and Billy, to review by Friday the 5th. Um, in the hopes of getting uh, that out to Kyle uh, the following week. Um, I believe he's got kind of a deadline of the November 26th to kind of have most of these things uh, submitted. And so on that note, uh, Stephanie, I wanted and Kyle as well, um, see what makes the most sense as far as like format of this document. So I was thinking of kind of following a bit of kind of what the PSD did and have kind of for each section um, explaining the issues and like kind of providing a justification for why it's important, um, going over um, what we've decided, um, kind of the high level, you know, 30,000 foot view, then go into the specific um, regulations that are already in place, uh, kind of cite what regulations and how they would be abided by. Um, kind of then move into specific or like example language, which I know that the CCB will actually take the bulk of that over, but do it as much as we can from um, other states um, as needed, um, if there's gaps, and then uh, kind of go through with like outstanding issues or other areas of concerns or kind of break down how to think about certain things that maybe we haven't come to a conclusion or depending on what the other committees are, you know, uh, have determined um, anything I'm kind of missing there or any other I don't know, insights or structure wise um, no that makes sense um, I the yeah they, I mean their recommendations to the board so they can you know be couched as such that you know we agreed to something and we're recommending this um, but yeah no I, that that seems to address all the addresses the is a, is a good format <laughs> to share information with the CCB yeah I think it's a good format too and again Jacob did did reference I have presented our conversations around waste disposal energy um, water in the context of what to what you're going to need to show and prove from a municipal local utility perspective depending on where you are in the state and whether or not you're you're pulling from municipal water or on-site water everything's been very smooth at the board level some questions that i was able to navigate fairly fairly easily although i wish all of you were there to help me some at points but hey that's 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 process right so we've gotten approval to move in a lot of the recommended directions i still think this report will be very valuable 
as we move towards the rulemaking phase because this is where the rubber will kind of meet the road with how we kind of shape this directional um, you know perspective that we're that we've been that the board is, is fully comfortable um, adopting from the subcommittee so just wanted to say that even though I've started to kind of check boxes off from my perspective this report will be very very helpful and informative uh, as we start to enter a new phase of our work yeah oh, and also add I forgot to mention um, part of that will also be kind of um, compliance implementation um, aspects so like actual you know what's on the ground so like you know what I was looking at kind of like pesticide lists so kind of going through what's already done and how what other states are doing kind of justifications for EPA or like whatever the federal guidelines are but then also like the practical aspects of um, you know worker health and safety and um, you know pesticide application or applicator trainings or courses or like you know what that looks like and then have a list of kind of outstanding guidance materials materials that like can or could be created to kind of help um, you know the licensees or implementation um, so lay those out as well I just wanted to also add based on um, what you just said Jacob that the agency we do have training and exams that individuals must take in order to use um, pesticides. So we have a lot of that already built within the agency, um, but certainly, uh, you know, and it's a, in accordance with federal law as well as state law. So, <laughs> um, so it, it does exist, um, just so you, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of time maybe um, on that because we, we do have a process in the state of Vermont. Yeah, no, perfect. Yeah, and I think for a lot of these things would just be like linking to either the agency or the web materials are already there. Um, and um, yeah, and then essentially um, just, I guess, like, you know, kind of offering our advice or recommendations on who could oversee this or, yeah, what's already there. Um, and so it's not going to be like a, hopefully not a hundred, <laughs> you know, 150 page document. Um, but no, that's a great, great point. Um, all right. So then. I think to start off, I know how you wanted to talk to us um, about, you know, cultivation standards, but specifically kind of like the cultivator operational requirements. Yeah. Oh. So, and I can give an overview. So one of the things I'm going to be speaking with the board tomorrow about is specific operational requirements for cultivators. To me, that kind of resembles a farm plan or a cultivation plan or an operation plan, however you want to characterize it but but the content within that plan I think is important for us to discuss and get to your perspective Stephanie as as you know in your role overseeing the hemp program what's kind of asked of folks at the beginning and things that I'm I'm considering or thinking about asking and I don't want this to be overly burdensome I'm thinking like a 10 page I, I guess it's kind of like a in some way a some degree kind of like a business plan but not from the you know, just just from the cultivation perspective of that plan. So it's stuff like, you know, and some of this is already being asked for in our application, but I think it's important to have kind of like a standalone document so we understand cultivation techniques, what you're planning to do, so on and so forth, um, and wondering how often this should be updated. Th those kind of questions are something that I, I thought would be good for discussion here today. But I was thinking, you know, site description, cultivation schedule, your propagation and initial transplant, um, mixed light cultivation plan if applicable, irrigation plan and schedule if applicable, how you're planning to harvest, dry, and trim, your employee plan, how many employees are you planning to have, who's in charge, who's the lead cultivator, assistant cultivator, are you using seasonal laborers, and then the use and storage of regulated products, and, and I mean there, you know, nutrients, pesticides, fungicides stuff like that and I think uh, recognizing your your expertise and I can talk to others at the agency of ag too if we need to um, what's best management practices there uh, making sure folks have a waste disposal plan I think we've talked about that in its general context and provided options for people but what are they actually going to do and then a product and product management so their testing plan and plan to control inventory before transportation um, up the supply chain. So that's kind of generally speaking what I'm thinking of when I talk about an operational or cultivation plan. You know, I know other jurisdictions require this um, as part of their application checklist, so to speak. I'm, I haven't really talked in this about environmental considerations. 
yet, um, and it's something that I think we should talk about here. What's a baseline information that we should include in an operational plan from an environmental perspective, recognizing that we under 164 have to prioritize folks with how sustainable their um, cultivation techniques are going to be. And so I want to make sure if we do develop the sustainability matrix that I've discussed, um, where's a good baseline to start recognizing that people might want to prioritize themselves by giving us more information. So any initial thoughts? <laughs> um, I, I think when you ask for the information um, to the, yeah, you, you're going to need to, as you mentioned, um, build a matrix, I mean, at least from the sustainability perspective, building a matrix so to see whether or not people are meeting the board's expectations to then be prioritized down the road. Um, obviously, I mean, the, you mentioned that. Um, but collecting information that's useful to the CCB um, that helps you understand some standard or requirement that you guys are putting in your rule, um, which we may or may not know at this point in time. Um, but, you know, like some of these are just business practices and they may change or shift. And so gathering information about an irrigation schedule or whether or not they're, you know, going to use some kind of time controlled system or, you know, like. But understanding that that might change, like I just think, you know, getting that information, if it's helped you, it helps you to make a decision is great. But if 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 it changes, do you need it to be updated? Like, how much interaction are you going to have on a regular basis with these applicants? I guess that's just my thing um, that I just something that I would be concerned of laying out a clear expectation for that interaction and when changes are made. Um, so th that's my contribution to the conversation at this point. Um, Thanks, Stephanie. Jacob, do you have any thoughts there? I, I know that these are present in other jurisdictions. I'm assuming you've probably laid your eyes on, on them and understand, to Stephanie's point, things change when you actually try and apply something in practice from your plan at some point. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of states that require, you know, in the application process, I mean, they can be like 300 pages long um, and they want like everything, like all of the SOPs and all of that. And that really has led to, you know, quite a robust like consulting business, which just leads to, you know, a lot of cost and a lot of expertise. So I think kind of moving away from that, so I think that is kind of like a one barrier of, of entry, I think. You know, schedule is not as important as potentially knowing like harvest cycles, um, which kind of goes into, you know, knowing if they're going to be like indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, you know, are they going to be doing, you know, light depth, two harvest, three harvest, you know, four to six, if they're indoor, you know, that kind of stuff. I think um, propagation is important. Like, how are they going to actually be um, sourcing, you know, their ingredients? Because there's always kind of like the, you know, immaculate inception of an industry of like how do you get the genetics in you know and, and whatnot um and then i think from like an sop i think more broadly talking about um like what kind of lights are they using are they using climate control what's their irrigation system going to be like so maybe not like necessarily the schedule but are they going to be doing you know drip irrigation or micro emitters or ebb and flow you know that kind of stuff or hand watering i think knowing the the grow medium and grow style is, you know, relatively important. Um, you know, is it a hydroponic system or soilless medium or living soil? Because um, those kind of things will kind of just let you know kind of what their resource use would be on like kind of a macro high level. I think um, understanding kind of materials list, you know, could be important. Um, but I think like definitely IPM. The, the integrated pest management, that's going to be probably a, a big thing just because, like, we see, you know, growers use the wrong thing when it's an emergency and they're kind of facing a critical crop loss. So, just making sure that they are kind of at least thinking about how are they going to deal with, you know, common pests, you know, uh, botrytis, spider mites, powdery mildew, aphids, that kind of thing, so that there is like a plan in place and they're prepared for that so that you kind of, you know, are losing some of the, you know, shadier practices that we've seen in the, in the cannabis industry. Um, and then, yeah, waste disposal. And then I think from a sustainability um, environmental impact would be to have like, what are their efficiency practices and how are they thinking about it? So are they not at all, or are they, you know, capturing their water, recycling their, you know, fertigation, um, you know, are they doing constructed wetlands for, you know, some of this stuff or you know whatever it may be 
um, and then kind of like dividing it into maybe that's like either a checklist um, or, you know, whatnot. Like, are they, you know, using water efficiently? If so, like how, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Yeah, I was thinking just as, as Jacob was going through the list, there because there are recommendations relative to what the PS, um, the public service department has recommended and or what is recommended from the air pollution and climate division, um, and then uh, you know it, the need for wastewater permits or not, um, that kind of stuff. Like I feel like your checklist could really integrate with that so that you can receive information from the applicant to see the direction that they're moving in that otherwise complies with those recommended requirements so that there's a link. Um, and then if you do get the information, thinking about how you're gonna respond to that information if something seems amiss as well um, and what that process is. Um, again, you know, getting information and, and asking for the information that you actually need and being transparent as to what you're gonna use that information for, I think is really, really important because then otherwise people think they're submitting information into a black hole and they don't know what the purpose is. And that can be very frustrating, I think, for any kind of applicant in any process. Um, and you know what, you could start off small and get bigger. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be like, check the big boxes. <laughs> right, <laughs> no. If you need to make it, you know, like you're all, we're missing this piece of information, so we need to make a change. Um, and then preparing everybody for what that change is down the road. Absolutely, and I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to create another paperwork exercise for folks. I'm thinking a negligible five to ten page document that kind of outlines and ensures that they've thought about certain requirements ahead of time instead of us having to do all of that education and hopefully not enforcement, but enforcement on the back end when things kind of do go amiss. So it's just getting folks yeah. moving in, in a certain direction. Yeah, collecting information in support of them showing that they're gonna be compliant with wh whatever your rules are. That I support that link. Absolutely. Yeah. I think like what's super beneficial is just thinking about like how like Illinois rolled it out where they're already like two years behind on, you know, actually uh, giving out licenses and like their corrective actions weren't really like understood very well, um, really hard to interpret from like, you know, after people have submitted the applications. Um, they're also in a different system um, because I think they, were, they had limited number of uh, licenses in each category uh, being distributed. So it was a much more, um, I think like competitive environment than Vermont's trying to roll out. But I think having, um, yeah, just kind of going over with like Stephanie is saying is just potentially having a um, list of just responses. So like this was blank or this was inadequate, then you kind of already have that done and then providing resources, you know, that are available. So like Efficiency Vermont, if they didn't have like a, you know, an, a robust energy plan or whatever, so that they can, you know, essentially figure that out. Um, you're not just like, hey, we need an energy policy. You right. know? And then they're just like, I don't even know what that means. Um, you can at least, you know, put them in the right direction. Because um, I imagine even for like manufacturers, there's going to be a lot of, you know, international fire code stuff and all of these safety things. And that, you know, if there's certain things that are not there, um, you know, they're going to have to do that. Or think about like the recommendations we made for like the 1.7, you know, PPE for lighting fixtures, you know, having, you know, a resource to that, you know, linking to like the design light consortium or whatever. So they can, right. you know, at least understand what that um you know i think it was is. yeah and, and just just on the energy stuff specifically i think it was clear from my conversation with with james and julie yesterday energy code and energy lingo is its own um, skill set when it comes to understanding things and they're comfortable with all those recommendations but just want to make sure we develop guidance for folks that don't understand what that necessarily means not assuming that folks don't but just making sure folks understand the requirements in plain language yeah and then also like how these things are being determined so you know i mean i think we've done it on a fixture level so like what does like 1.7 mean where can you find that you know and then essentially relating that to you know how growers understand so like most light standard is like uh at least for like hbs or metal halides or whatever it's like using a four by four footprint so you know how do you estimate you know your uh um you know 
footprint. I guess that's actually not part of the regulations with things like that. So. Well, this is, uh, so I got an update for, um, well, I guess everybody. It's kind of tangentially related to this, but it is related to land use um, and environmental practices, I think, from a, a certain perspective. So I had a, a good conversation yesterday with the current use program at the tax department. And Jacob and Tom, current use is how we, um, define at the tax level agricultural land and how it's taxed differently than other commercial residential areas. Hopefully, that's a good overall description. Stephanie, you might know you might know a little bit more than I do. Um, but because of the way that this is classified as a non-agricultural product, only thousand square foot growers can really um, grow on land that's zoned current use right now and so all of our outdoor grows that are prospective outdoor grows operating at the 2500 5000 10000 20000 and the 375 eventually would have to take their land or a part of their land out of current use and Steffi, i know we have had some conversations about unpacking what that exactly means and what perceived penalties may need to be paid um, to the tax department if you're going to take something out of current use. And I thought, given the nature of 164 and this not being an agricultural product, I think the, the <laughs> current use program seems to be willing to work with us to the extent that they're able to under the law. So they kind of told me, first I said, how often does this happen? They said thousands of people change their current use status every year. So they're not new to this process, which is, which is great. On the flip side of that, we're putting a lot of work on them to a, an agency that already is developed or already has some bandwidth and backlog issues. But they told me, you know, let's say you have a hundred acre parcel, you want to enter a 5,000 square foot canopy tiering size outdoors. You can take just a small portion or parcel of that thousand acre track out of current use. It doesn't need to be the whole thing. And they're going to assess it for value. Uh, but not penalize you unless you plan on actually developing it. And they're not defining cannabis as development. It's just a different use um, on the agricultural land that's not agricultural. But if you do want to build like a drying facility or a curing facility, then you might have to, to pay something. Um, it's really dependent on operation, but you can take a half an acre out and we could write rules around, you know, if you have a 5,000 square foot total canopy, you want to take a half an acre of your 100 acre parcel out of current use. You could uh, rotate that 5,000 square foot canopy around that one half acre, you know, every season, depending on how you, because it's, it's harder to crop rotate considering everything and how things are, um, written as is but I just want to give you that update that it sounded like for all intents and purposes um, they're of a similar understanding to us and want to make sure that folks aren't unduly burdened um, that are just trying to enter the market they also kind of indicated as long as the paperwork is submitted they're comfortable with people putting plants in the ground they don't need to wait for that actual change of status to actually occur on the back end they told me it can take 60 to 90 days for that change to actually happen um, and they know that we can't wait for that so um, as soon as somebody files their paperwork with the current use program, they, they would be comfortable from a tax perspective on on a, a cultivation site for those outdoor tiers that are over a thousand feet. I have a question on that though. With the taking out of the use for the land, does that also include like farm structures? So like if I'm a you know cultivator and I have a barn that I'm storing, you know, one of my agricultural products or uh, you know one of my materials. Can I also use that barn to dry, you know, and store, use it in the cannabis business, or does that actually have to get, you know, do I build another structure that's not in previous agricultural use, or how is that working? They were, the focus was building a new, developing this parcel, not in ag, uh, not in current use, and that's when you would trigger penalties. Um, we didn't necessarily talk about existing structures that are part of your farm operation. I mean, existing facilities that you want to dry or cure in will still have to be updated potentially to kind of meet security requirements we're going to put in place for those those facilities. Um, but they didn't seem to be all too concerned with, with sharing buildings that are otherwise farm buildings. Hey, okay. hey Kyle, you, you, you said as long as it's not processing, 
if you're just changing, you're just growing cannabis, it's still, it's still considered ag, right? There's not that change in use. They, they told me that they need to assess it for all intensive purposes, as if you were going to pay a penalty, that change of use of the land, but they're not going to require you pay that penalty unless you physically develop the land. And they're not saying cannabis is development. They're, they're talking about uh, subdividing it or something like that um, down the road. I, yeah, I think what, um, based on what Kyle said, it sounds like you have to remove that land from the current use program. So you wouldn't no longer, it would now be assessed at its highest and best use from year to year, but you wouldn't incur a penalty unless you physically built something on the ground. Yeah, they're gonna assess it and record what that-, what that really yeah. Does that make, is that accurate? That's Kyle? accurate. And I'm sorry that I'm not the best tax lingo um, <laughs> interpreter, but this is, this is the gist of the conversation. Um, and, and so I thought it was about as good as we could have hoped for and expected, considering how this is treated through 164. Yeah, yeah I would just clarify or encourage the enforcement of that to allow for shared building. So just thinking like if I'm a you know manufacturer and I have a warehouse and I'm using part of my warehouse for something else, I'm going to be able to use the other part of my warehouse for cannabis, you know, manufacturing if it's up to code and everything like that without, you know, incurring any issue. And so it's just kind of um, potentially burdening, you know, farmers um, when other industries or other aspects, sectors of the industry are not going to have that issue. I'll double check, but it, they didn't seem to be overly concerned with that. It was more about the, you know, something needs to be assessed at its highest value and then you're building something on it, you know, so um, versus existing structures. But I'll double check. On the flip side of this, for those farmers that are enrolled in current use, taking land out limits their ability, possibly, and I don't have any statistics, but you have to meet a certain standard. Either, I think it's income, I mean, it's a whole bunch. I mean, there's eligibility requirements for being enrolled in current use. So if you take land out, it could impact your ability to continue to be enrolled with the other land. <laughs> so that's just a connection that we haven't talked about. <laughs> Um, but that's possible as well. If we pull the string of yarn, I'm sure we'll, we'll do a lot more of figuring out how, you know, they understand that we're in uncharted waters considering how this is, for all intents and purposes, a plant growing out of the ground, not, not legally considered one. So, um, but we're doing our best to kind of unpack and educate ourselves and each our sister agencies ahead of time so we, can anticipate as much as we can and start developing guidance for folks that want to seek a license higher than the thousand square feet where this wouldn't be an issue. Um, perfect, yeah. Um, so that's everything on that. Um, so I've got pesticides down here. Um, I know we weren't talking about pesticides specifically, but I think it was the actual, what would be required from like a compliance side. So Is yeah, that correct? Uh, Stephanie, let me tell you what I'm asked to talk about tomorrow, which this is the bullet. Pesticides are classes of pesticides that may be used, must comply with ag pesticide control regs. And that kind of comes through 164. Um, and I know we talked about pesticides on Monday. I just need, and I can talk with Carrie and Dave at, you know, at Ag to kind of walk through how I should present that we want to make sure that anything that anybody's using is in, is approved through the Agency of Agriculture. I don't know if you have a subset, and I know EPA is starting to wander into these waters now that it's federally legal, but how do we want to message what can be used or how to determine if something can be used to this new market? Um, well, I can share what we use prior to EPA approving pesticides for use on hemp. Um, I have a, a PDF of a document, um, and it, you could either change the word to hemp, or I could, I mean, change the word to cannabis, or I could change the word to cannabis and share that with you. Um, and that's specifically related to active ingredients, which we talked about last meeting. Um, and then relative to the actual regulation 
um, like a pesticide misuse or uh, pesticide residue or whatever. I, my assumption was that the agency, and I, and I don't know this, I guess the, I'm only one member of a subcommittee, <laughs> what the recommendation I would give is that the agency regulate and enforce those requirements, both related to the education and training of those individuals that are, you know, like they have to be certified applicators um, for the class of pesticide that's being used. <laughs> um, and then obviously those operations that are selling those pesticides retail need to be licensed to do so and to provide advice to individuals that are buying those pesticides. Like that's a whole, it's very nitty gritty. It's, you know, 72 pages of regulation that the agents, I mean, on the, under the new regulation <laughs> that the agencies um, going through the uh, Administrative Procedures Act on. Um, so yeah, again, my recommendation is we can provide a list of things that, of active ingredients that are allowable um, for use on cannabis. And then the regulation of pesticides and applicators and education and training requirements will be regulated by the Agency of Agriculture. If you could send me that. Very simple. Yeah, if you could send me that list and then yes. put into email that sentence or two that you just said, how we can use the Agency of Agriculture and their expertise. That's all I need at this point in time, and we can kind of dig okay. into this list um, when we get more to the proposed reg stage. This is just kind of signaling that we want to not run afoul of what the Agency of Agriculture is trying to accomplish with requiring certain tests for applicators, you know, registration for selling, so on and so forth um, yeah. in, in our in our regulations. So that would be extremely helpful. Yeah, yeah. and then, and then uh, in, in, in addition to just follow, letting the agency regulate, the agency would enforce misuses right. and all that kind of stuff as well, like the whole, I think the whole that, package. I think that makes sense. We need to, you know, work through experts at, at what they're what they're doing here and squarely in within the agency of agriculture from that perspective so i, I understand that and also have um which i can send out to you as well um this is a good write-up i found um that kind of goes through where the epa stance is like what is kind of how they came to their decisions what their current thinking is because i know in the you know you had semi stephanie goes through on kind of how they were classifying things so like it has to be um, like registered for non-specific crop product, um, all of that. Um, and then also kind of what some states are doing from a pesticide um, residue limit. So they're kind of doing the most stringent for any food product. So like in Oregon, it's like 0.1 parts per million of any kind of residue. Um, but then also this, this uh, document I found has like every state and where they land on all of this. Um, and so I had a question actually for you, Stephanie, was where do where does like 25B exemptions come in to play? I was kind of going through the list you provided me with the uh, Washington, Oregon, Colorado that actually have the active ingredients list, but then also the products list. And so there was a few on there that were acceptable because it's, you know, I can't think of the technical word, but like generally considered safe or non-harmful or whatever. Um, so there's a few things on there. I think it was like sulfur and and maybe some other things that are allowed um, that weren't necessarily on your list. I was wondering because those a lot of those are like in the 25B exemptions. Yeah, I think it's in, and I could be wrong and I should check with Carrie, but I think it's generally 25Bs that are on our list. And then I think oxidate is maybe the only item that's not a 25B, but then could be used. But I would have to check with Carrie. Um, I'm. Um, I'm not entirely certain about that. Um, and then relative to the, um, you also mentioned earlier, um, Jacob, the list of pesticide, um, like a residue on a, on a crop that's otherwise not on that list. So like there's the difference between the list of allowable products and then there's the contaminant list that individ that states test for. Um, and we do have a list that we use for hemp. It's, I think it's like 12 or 13 compounds um, that are of high concern for the state of Vermont. And I do know that there are other states that have much longer lists um, and with you know the, the maximum amount of detection after testing. Um, uh, so so we, we do have a list in the hemp program um, and the CCB can adopt a, a higher list. Actually, I, I wanna say that the 
that under our chapter, um, our Title VI uh, in Chapter 34, relative to the Cannabis um, Quality Control Program, the Agency of Agriculture sets those that contaminant list and the action limits for pesticides. Um, I think that's within our control currently, um, but I can <laughs> share that with you, the statutory citation as well as um, that list of 12, 13 compounds that are um, that, that we test for, at least on both actually on cannabis and hemp that we require to be tested for. If it's on cannabis today, we don't have any authority to enforce because we don't enforce cannabis law, <laughs> but we do enforce it on hemp. <laughs> um, perfect, yeah, and I can share with you, I, uh, I have a guy, I can't think of one of his shared with me, but it's like from California, it was kind of like, uh, um, inspector list of like commonly used pesticides for illegal cannabis grow, so like what you would come across. And I want to say there's like 34 different um, things on like mycobutanol and you know, all the really nasty stuff. Um, and so we could see if like that list needs to be expanded or at least just things for them to kind of keep an eye out for that like is you know used or has been used. So like especially with like you know you always have that. Um, period of the legacy growers coming into this market and knowing what they know and what works and you know what's not acceptable um kind of thing um and then i wanted to see if there was any thought on putting in i know we talked about it briefly like timing but thinking for like what's a lot for like last resort and how that factors in um into things so i would like think about like for an ipm strategy if you're looking at like you know genetics and then uh, plant spacing, the beneficials, you know, travel, all of that, and then going into the sprays, like what's allowed to be done at preventative, at what stages, and then what can be actually used flowering, you know, as a last resort, and for what, and if there is going to be any kind of requirements on, you know, showing um, pest or disease pressures when using something, or that's kind of just going above and beyond. I, you know, we, I, I did have this conversation um, with Carrie this week about um, considering providing a list or guidance on how and when um, the allowed active ingredients could be applied to a cannabis plant. Um, and it, we talked about how, like, the decisions are business related um, and we wouldn't provide guidance. We would just allow the business to operate so long as they're operating within the, the approved or the, the list of approved active ingredients, uh, they can apply them when they when they see fit um, based on what their what they decide. It's again, it's their their business, um, so we wouldn't necessarily get involved in that. Quick, um, quick, but quick question. Being upfront that and transparent that you know we're going to test for these things and you can't use these at all. Um, right. I, all the, that that list, <laughs> like those aren't allowed. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, uh, and, but, and then if it's a, um, like a, and I don't know, um, of some kind of microbial based type of active ingredient, um, they would have to weigh the consideration of when to apply that in yeah. light of the fact that there will probably be a, a total combined yeast and mold test that they will have to satisfy in order for that crop to enter the market. Um, and so they need to make their decisions about when to apply again. Yeah. And that is definitely a concern, I think, for a lot of how to grow, um, you know, living soil, you know, a different uh, soil fertility things because of that. And so I was wondering, actually, Kyle, has the lab testing protocols kind of been recommended? Are they doing total colony forming units or are they actually going to be looking at um, like pathogens and harmful bacterial loads rather than just broad spectrum? I haven't seen anything from Carrie yet, <laughs> so I, I'm not at liberty to answer your question, but I think I know Bryn has talked with Carrie and, and Kim Watson, who's also on the lab testing subcommittee, and I think they're about at a point where they've kind of got some proposals ready to go. I just haven't, I haven't seen them at this time. But, but back to the, go ahead, Stephanie. I just can I yeah I wanted to uh, mention another thing like the 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 hemp program does have guidance regarding um, harvesting and um, when it's appropriate to you know like if you drop a flower on the ground like that's done <laughs> like you don't put that in the basket <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and 
And so we, we do have guidance relative to that in order to, I mean, reduce um, pathogens and risk um, during harvest activities and during packaging activities. So we have a, an FAQ about that on our website, and that's primarily based on um, the produce safety program guidance uh, uh, from FDA. Um, and the agency, the agency has delegation to administer that program. Um, so that's generally of a, you know, that's out there as guidance. And then the other um, item I wanted to mention is that the agency of ag uh, beginning in November, I believe, and maybe November 15th, um, is going to begin registering soil amendments uh, with the agency. So, so that's something that we are doing. And then, I mean, obviously it's a, I don't know that it's an assurance to any cannabis growers, but, but we will um, have our eyes on labels associated with that. Um, and then generally like raw manure um, should not be, you know, it has to be cured and developed. <laughs> it can't just be raw manure in a field um, when crops are intended for human consumption. So, but those are just general, those are out there already. Like that's not, should, well, maybe it's new information for new growers, but um, these are standards that exist. Are you recommending like gloves and beards and hair nets and all of that in the processing of things? We don't go to that level of detail, okay. um, but there's the, the, probably the most important thing that we go into detail about is the necessity to provide hand washing stations and sanitary facilities um, in fields. Obviously, this is outdoor cultivation um, within appropriate proximity and the requirements to wash your hands a lot. <laughs> Not yeah. just like all the time, <laughs> just general hygiene is probably yeah. mo the most effective um, tool in reducing um, transmission pathogens. What, what about surface contamination as far as like what materials can be used? Um, I'm thinking like, um, you know, the purple cell, like the quaternary um, things that's like, it's not a lot in organics, but a lot of people use it for like sanitizing of, um, you know, materials, uh, tools and... Yeah, I can't remember what we said um, in our guidance, but... Um, to the, I think, again, the, our guidance is based on um, the produce safety program administered at the Agency of Agriculture, and um, if it's not safe for food consumption purposes, then I think we would we would move people away from those products. Um, but I can't remember specifically what we said about cleaning surfaces and the appropriate products for that uh, purpose. Uh, yeah, I just bring it up because, like, I know if it is based on like, produce safety, it's still with a lot of those things. It's still based on materials being washed in cannabis. I think it's one of the few, um, you know, agricultural products that may never touch water from harvest to consumer, um, yeah. and so there is like potential issues there, and it's not never never being tested, you know, um, for those kind of things. Mm, okay. Um, and then. Um, that also kind of brings it up. It's a little of a tangent, but um, we never talked about like purple pipe reclaimed water and the usage of that on cannabis. I don't know what Vermont's laws are, if that's even allowed in agriculture. Um, but yeah, well, that's a term I'm not familiar with. But um, uh, so like reclaimed um, water, so it's like wastewater that's been recycled. Usually, it's you know it's through a municipality, uh, but it's like waste, it's like gray water systems. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we do have guidance with respect to water and the source of that water, and it depends on, um, and I could be wrong, but um, if if you're, and I, I'm thinking about actually drawing from surface water, which isn't gray water, but um, if it's like, you don't want to spray water that's not fit for human consumption over the canopy of mm -hmm. a plant. <laughs> but if you're doing irrigation and it meets specific standards, and I think we have water quality standards, um, it can be direct irrigation to the soil, possibly. But I, um, but I think we do have requirements for uh, a base level cleanliness, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, okay. Yeah, and I feel like for the most part, I mean, to avoid uh, botrytis and so many things, better mother, like most people are not going to be spraying um, anyways. Okay. But um, good, good to know. Um, I'm trying to think. There's one other. Thing thing um can't remember right now uh kyle do you have anything else to well, i want to circle back to one thing and, and i know you know stephanie you had said we don't want to get super prescriptive about when folks should be applying you know 
inputs or pesticides or whatever you want to call it. But if I'm, I'm thinking back to this cultivation or operational plan, if somebody's planning to use something, should we ask them to disclose that product in that operational plan? I can't remember if we talked about this at the beginning of this call or not. Um, but we didn't specifically. Um, again, it, because it's a plan, I, um, I mean, you can ask for what you want, but it's a plan and, and we'll never know until we have a, a misuse of some kind or opening an issue. Um, and I, people's ideas change too. So I, I'm not sure about that level of detail. There might be a reason to ask for that level of detail, but I can't think of one right at now at this moment. Um, I'm not saying I necessarily... You can just ask for, like maybe you can ask, what well, I think the plan is probably, what would be more useful maybe is in a records inspection after the close of a season, asking for people to keep records so that you look and see what they applied. Um, and so, and actually, when I was looking at the agenda, I was thinking about like, oh yeah, record keeping, record keeping is really important. So while we might not get it on the front end, you may want to look for information on the, on the back end and then review those records with inspections. Um, at the end of the, the harvest season or throughout the course of the year, if we have a bunch of indoor growers, I mean, they're gonna be doing this year, year round, um, um, but taking advantage of the seasonality of the crop and you know who's enrolled, like in being able to space that out, those records inspections out. Um, and, and actually records inspections are easily done um, over the internet, <laughs> just <laughs> through email. <laughs> um, so you can do a fair bit. We did that, you know, due to COVID within the hemp program, we just started to do um, requests for information via email so that we could still be in touch with our growers. Um, and I think that's a perfectly um, reasonable way to do that outreach and, and look at records, but also going onto the farm and, and looking at those records again. Um, I don't, yeah, I think, I think on the input side, I think at least a, um, an expectation that we will want to see records of, of what you've done isn't, yep. you know, out of the question. I think it's easy on a, on a calendar year cycle to do that for outdoors, but I'm wondering, Jacob, if we were thinking about the indoor grower, how many, how many harvests would we allow an indoor grower to, realizing that they're not operating on the calendar year like the outdoor growers would be, how many harvests do you think we should do like three or four before we require this kind of records request being sent to us? Does that make, does my question make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's value, at least for pesticides, uh, especially if you're, you know, one of the goals is to bring in the legacy growers being like, this is allowed, this isn't allowed, um, you know, at least from an active ingredient and have that, you know, checklist. I mean, there's a lot of states, Colorado does it. I know quite a few, I don't know, the reason behind it, but you have to put what pesticides you use. In some states, it's all materials on the actual, um, you know, product when it goes for sales. And I want to say my assumption is that it has to do with like um, the medical side of things, and for like immunocompromised or sensitive people knowing like what they're ingesting and if they might have like a reaction to that. So it's just like informing the consumer, but I'm not. Sure, but I do know that, like, you know, when you buy products in a lot of states, it'll have all of the, um, uh, at least active ingredients um, on there. Um, so there is that requirement. Um, you know, I, uh, I would say, you know, we really push for the growers that we work with is to have very robust um, record keeping because, you know, you're essentially facing a massive financial, you know, critical crop loss or something if this, if you guys are testing it or if it does get tested um, and there is a, you know, banned material in there and you have to destroy the entire batch or the entire grow they need to have that supporting documentation to figure out where that happened. Like, were they the ones who did it? Or did it happen at the processor using contaminated equipment from someone else or, you know, whatnot? And so it's just like a risk mitigation, you know, insurance like issues. So it's just like best practices, but knowing that, you know, a lot of legacy growers documenting everything was kind of like their court case. So like, it's a learning curve and, a, you know, a change of mindset. So there's definitely, you know, bringing them in and giving them as much guidance as possible. Um, but, so yeah, I would, um, 
on the basis of they provide a list and you know this whole application is being signed as like a legal truth that you know it's from when they submit it um you know i think there's not necessarily a main reason to have to be like oh you can't do three harvests you know more than three harvests without an inspection or without providing this information you know it's all kind of self-reported i think it's more um allow them to do business until some until proven otherwise kind of thing because also i think like what is your guys's capacity going to be on the state lab level or you know laboratory level in the reporting and how many auditors are going to have to actually you know assess these things so i think it's like easier to kind of say provide at least the best of your knowledge what you're using um potentially submitting a after season report if someone's actually going to review it um and then you know kind of see if anything happens and then if like you know i think having good reporting from the lab side of things so that if something um pops in a test um that's being reported to the state and then you guys can send out an inspector and figure out what's going on Jacob, I think Kyle was just asking, as far as record keeping is concerned, the difference between an outdoor and, and the harvest cycles and, and the indoor harvest cycles, and how much more an indoor might be burdened, just given the increased cycles in the indoor. Do, do, do you have a sense of that? No, because I, I mean, I feel like when you're cultivating on a commercial scale, or even like a homestead scale, I mean, it's you sh still SOPs. I mean, like you should be, you know, reporting internally at least every time you're using something so like it doesn't matter if you're you know harvesting your third you know crop but if it's still like august 1st and you're doing something you know it should be written down so i don't think necessarily um you know if you're indoor or outdoor if you're like one full season grow um first you know quick you know turn and burn weekly harvest i don't think that necessarily matters as much of a burden on like what materials you're using does so that make sense so jacob so uh, i'm thinking of, of just in your language the submit an after season report should that be like submit a report by thanksgiving no matter if you're indoors or outdoors that gives people time to get their plants out of the ground and transport it off their cultivation site but recognizing folks are, could still be in mid cycle depending on their indoor operation they just still need to have what they've done year to date by a certain date i, I guess is i'm just trying to make mm -hmm. sure that indoor and outdoor if we're asking for an after season report makes sense for both growing styles I, uh, kyle i might even suggest that um and we're just coming to it now in the hemp program is is requesting planting reports um you could either request them to be sent to you or that they be maintained by the registrant um, so that you know when inf when plants are going in the ground, you might, you know, in specific information about that particular planting, um, clone, seed, whatever, um, and maybe this goes to the process of how you got your starts or how you developed your starts. Um, and then um, by cultivar, or by harvest lot, when maybe you want harvest lots to be cultivar specific like these are you know the, that's the kind of that record keeping detail um, and you can ask for that information to be sent to the CCB or you can just make sure that they keep that information so that it can be inspected at some point during the course of the year based on a schedule that you've set and I think you could be I don't know you want to do it random do you want to assess risk on when you do inspections like there's a couple of ways you could do that <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, anyway just lots of lots of ways uh, and it can change over time. Like it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be dialed in like really fine within the rule, just so that people who are participating have given fair notice as to what's being required of them, and that it might be random, which yeah. is perfectly acceptable. Yeah, I would say from a practical point of view, ha having an application report, at least for pesticides, submitted or on hand at the either the time of harvest or when it's being transferred because it doesn't make sense to do it mid-season because you're not going to get the full picture and i think even for an indoor that's doing multiple harvests a year ideally they're going to be using the same products and then most of them will just have a list of everything they would potentially use and they'll just submit that even if they didn't use everything so that they're covering all their bases so i think like having that requirement um because it just like makes 
makes the most sense. Um, so the thing is, like, if you did it, let's say, like, September, we sell plants in the ground, or November, and, like, the season's going late, you know, you just don't know. Um, and so I think, like, you know, you're requiring them to have that on hand in case there is an inspection, um, or, and then they get issued non-compliance or, you know, some other issue if it's not there, um, or, you know, passing that along to the, um, you know, within the manifest or something, you know, it just depends on, I think, on what Vermont wants to, to deal with that information. Um, but then also I think there's an opportunity there for like third party certifications, organic, all of that. And you can essentially say like, if you've been third party audited, you know, then you may be exempt from this requirement, you know, something like that. Got it. Well, we don't have any, uh, both of our public uh, members left, <laughs> so they must have been bored with our conversation, but I have been very um, pleased and this has been really great for tomorrow. I know we have a couple minutes left. Jacob said one thing that reminded me I have to at least discuss it initially tomorrow, and that's disposal of crops if it doesn't meet um, testing standards or just quality standards as it's coming out of you know, a field or an indoor grow operation. And Stephanie, I know you've got procedures in place from a hemp perspective for hot crops and how to dispose of them, but this is slightly different than that. So I'm wondering, Jacob, what's like the industry standard for those set of circumstances I just laid out? Let's say you do a quality test, it's not up to stuff, you don't want to enter it into the retail market. How do you dispose typically of that crop? Yeah, well now, um, for better or worse, there are so many different remediation processes out there. Not so much for flowers, like flower, and that's like what I would hope to avoid in Vermont with the um, testing is like so many people now are like x-ray irradiating um, cannabis. You know, originally people were using like, um, like hydrogen peroxide and doing a spray when they were harvesting. Uh, but now I've been seeing more and more of these just like massive x-ray machines. and. Um, I'm pretty sure that within the Vermont guidance, it's supposed to come with like a radioactive symbol on the product. Um, but, um, you know, everyone's just doing that so that it doesn't fail um, microbials. But then, um, you know, I would say that a lot of the industry is if there's like a pesticide issue or a heavy metal issue, um, the most likely will. Um, you know, blast it through with the, some kind of like into distillate. And then there's a lot of different um, filtration methods out there now. I'm not too big on it, um, but I know that there's a lot of like, I think um, clay or colloidal clay or carbon filter, um, yeah, activated carbon or whatnot that will like remediate that. So I would say that potentially requiring the flower to be destroyed, you know, it's gonna put a lot of people out of business. So I think like ensuring that whatever, and he needs to get flagged, I think. Um, but then, you know, if there is a safe and efficient way of remediating it into oil that removes everything or at least gets it below whatever the level is, you know, I think that would be what most growers would want to do. But I don't think the flower can be remediated itself. I think you would usually get um, concentrated into distillate, and then that distillate would go through a filtration process. Stephanie, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree entirely. Um, I don't think there's going to, I mean, hopefully there's not mass destruction of, of flour in this world, that it does get moved um, through the system for another purpose. Uh, but I do think even if it gets moved through the system for another purpose, following on um, Jacob's comments, it still needs to be retested so that you can prove that it's met the standard, whatever that standard is. So a question um, that I have, and it's just um, how our licensing structure is, is teed out right now. No, nobody who holds a cultivation license has the ability to, to do any type of processing with just that cultivation license. Any type of cultivate, any type of processing has to go through the product manufacturer license, and there's multiple tiers depending on how safe their specific um, operation is when it comes to manufacturing. Should I, should the board suggest that from a remediation perspective, that cultivator would be able to do this without a manufacturer coming into the picture? Or, you know, I know that there's different ways to do it. It's not necessarily safe. Would they have to work with a manufacturer to remediate this for them? I, I think so. Just because you want to make sure it's done appropriately. You know, it's a big public health and safety thing. So I think like having that done by professionals is probably the best um, way. 
Cool. Okay. Knowing that there's a lot of cherry picking um, going on with like representative samples and actual testing and stuff, you know, so they easily could, you know, take something from a different batch or whatever, that test clean, and then that gets into, you know, the thing I think like having a professional thing do that is probably the best way. Stephanie? No, I, I totally agree. And it just means you're, you're either selling into another market or you're moving your crop into another market. I think you could still be registered as the lower tier manufacturer to get that distillate back in your possession to then do an edible product, for instance. It's just, um, but I think it's, yeah, no, I think that's fine. Um, yeah, okay, just wanted to, I, I was I just- I think it might be by design, in fact. Yeah, it was just something I foresaw the way this conversation was going to make sure we're clear that you can't do this yourself necessarily. You still need to work. And I mean, you can hold multiple licenses of different licenses. So you could do it yourself, but you have to have the license to do it yourself is, is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and I would also say like, but I do on that note, because I was reading what the, um, the recommendations from like the BCA and all of that. Um, and I do make a really bad point that I think farmers, growers should be able to do solventless extraction on site. Um, you know, making bubble hash, essentially rosin, anything that doesn't use the solvent, I think is one, it's going to really help small farmers, um, you know, be able to process their own trim or whatever, create a new revenue stream, um, but also, you know, help them brand themselves and not have to pay, um, you know, a bunch of, of money to get that process. You know, they're already gonna be losing quite a bit, you know, requiring with the trimming and all of that. So I think potentially allowing low tech, um, non-hazardous, non-harmful ways of processing cannabis would be ideal, at least on a small scale. So long as it meets the standards for contaminant testing. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's concentrate. Oh, it's like different yeah. from this, different from yeah. like the contamination. I'm just saying in general, like if it's clean and whatever is, you know, if they're able to at least, you know, process some of their own product, I think is, uh, you know, is useful. Well, Stephanie, I know you helped create, um, you are on the market structure subcommittee. We do have two tiers of product manufacturing licenses, but if I were to suggest something like Jacob is considering and suggesting, how is that different from that lower, safer tier product manufacturing category that we've already developed? And I don't know if it I, is. I will admit I don't remember. I I participated. It's been a couple weeks, and now I don't remember, so I can't answer that question. But um, I can certainly look into it and, and email you to yeah. see whether or not the lower tech um, bubble hash um, rosin resin um, uh, processing is available to the cultivator, small cultivator, or any cultivator. I'd have to look into it. I don't remember. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll also throw in, I can't remember, I'll have to look into what specifics. I do know there's like so many cultivation facilities early on where we're being raided and being and plants are being destroyed. It's like they're using 820 and I can't remember exactly if like remediation didn't exist then, but I think that's also just like a public health issue of just like exposing your workers to that without proper PPE. So like there is, I think, some red lines on like when product just has to get destroyed as well, depending on like what they've used. Because like if I remember correctly, um, like Eagle 20 is just like a derivative of like Agent Orange. and it's like really terrible stuff. Um, like yeah, Michael Butanol, it's just, it's terrible. Yeah, and it hugely impact the, um, I mean, consumer issue, mm. you know. So I actually have another meeting I have to jump on to. So thank you so much for the conversation, Kyle. I will get back to you with some information about pesticides, a recommendation, and then citation to the cannabis quality control program's ability to set standards for cannabis. And I think that was it. Those are the three things. I would, oh, and then the market um, to look into um, the licensing structure in the marketplace. But I gotta, I gotta run, gotta jump. Thanks, Thanks. everybody, Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gina, we'll thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jacob. Well, all right. All right, take care, everyone.